Okay, welcome back. So we are starting a new topic actually. So the topic is how to quantify the similarity, whatever that means, of two random variables. So this is a question. Okay. So please remember that. Remember that. If I assume we have two vectors, let's say vector x and vector y, we have defined the angle between these two vectors, theta, okay? And these vectors can be vectors in n dimensions or they can be abstract vectors. Whatever the case is, if I can define a vector space and in that vector space I can define an inner product, let's say, then I can define the angle between these two vectors. So let's assume that I define, you know, the usual inner product, something like this, which is as you know, well, if I have an x vector in n dimensions, whose entries are x1 up to xn, okay, the inner product is nothing but the element wise multiplication and then summation of all the products. Okay, this is the inner product. Now, how we define this angle? Let's remember. So that cosine theta, for this case, is defined as the inner product divided by, let me put this over here, norm of x times norm of y. Okay? Cosine theta is defined in, in this way. Well, actually we have defined this through Cauchy-Schwarz. You may remember we have defined an um, Cauchy-Schwarz inequality and we have said that this number on the right hand side is in magnitude less than 1. Okay? Since it's in magnitude less than 1, I can associate a theta angle to this number. Okay? And that's how we define this theta. Of course, in n-dimensional vectors or in three-dimensional vectors or two-dimensional vectors, this makes uh, a lot of sense because this is the actual angle between these two vectors. Okay, so how can I write this explicitly? Well, using this. How about the norms? These are the norms induced by this inner product, as we have discussed before. So square root of, you know, the Euclidean norm. Okay. So this is our earlier knowledge. But as you see, over here we have these concepts from n-dimensional vectors. We have generalized them through an abstract definition of inner product, and we can define an angle. Now I will do. I will try to do the same for random variables. Okay. Assume for now x and y are zero mean random variables. This is for now. We will later remove this restriction of being zero mean. Okay, now I will define something like, you will recognize it hopefully, Rxy. This is called correlation coefficient. And it is written as something like this. Maybe you can recognize the similarity of this. Since this is a definition, let's put this triangle over here. And this is the definition for correlation coefficient, but let's remember, this is the definition for expected value of x, zero mean, 
expected value of phi, zero mean, is equal to zero. Okay? So this is a specific definition. Let me write our xy definition for the zero mean case. So how would you write this expectation? Let me try to explain this a little bit further. Maybe it will be looking similar to this one. So our xy is equal to, so about the numerator? Numerator is xy and I have joint density. These integrals are spanning whole plane, so minus infinity to infinity and so on. So on the denominator I have this is x squared f of x dx minus in, this is infinity y squared f of phi dy and that is it. Well, do they look similar? Indeed, they look similar, but you can see that there is some um, additional terms like density functions over here and I have integrals instead of summations. But the form is quite similar. So what can I say for this one? If I introduce, for example, a weight over here, so this will be the weighted norm. Okay? I can easily introduce these weights also over here. So you can say that this is corresponding to that weight then, in a way. So this like weighted sum. So you see that all of these x values in this range are squared and weighted by some number and added up. So let me erase this. I think it's clear. So this is the same. All of the possible x values, they are squared and weighted by some number and added up. So you may interpret this like some weighted. So there is a weighting going on. Indeed, that weight in the pro volta discussions it's with respect to this density function. Then you may say that this weight is looking different from this weight because this is the joint density, this is the marginal density. But how about this? I can write this part also as a two integral if you wish. So I have x squared over here, but I can write, you know, if you wish, I can write this as, so this is the marginal density, dx. Do you remember, if I marginalize out over joint density with respect to y, I get this marginal density of x. Now, if that is the case, as you see, now combine these two integrals, I have two integrals, again the same weights and so on. It's exactly the same. Okay? So putting here weights and putting these joint density, it's exactly the same. Of course, they are a little different because I have a summation over here, I have an integration over there, but conceptually, they are looking very similar. Okay. So let me write some properties of this. Now, definition is correlation coefficient. Properties of correlation coefficient. So I think you will recognize these properties immediately. R x y in magnitude less than one. Okay. Number two, if R x y in magnitude is one, the maximum possible value in magnitude, then y is equal to, let me write capital Y, random variable y, and random variable x, they are related according to this. So y is equal to a and x. So this says that if this correlation coefficient definition, take its maximum value, random variable y, or let's say this is a vector, vector y is aligned with, what is this a, a is just a scalar, aligned with random variable x, whatever that means, okay, aligned. So this is just scaled version of the other one. But how can I prove this? Well, proof, Okay, I will do this very fast because we have done something very similar uh, for the cauchy schwarz inequality discussion. So this will be much faster. So let me do this. Um, if I write x plus lambda y, capital X, this is obviously greater than or equal to zero. 
because argument of this expectation is greater than or equal to zero. And expectation is nothing but argument times density integration. So everything is positive under the integrand. So this is greater than or equal to zero. So if I do this expectation, then I get terms like this. Lambda square Am I right? Expected value of x square. And this is supposed to be, again, greater than or equal to zero. So I have expanded this, and I have this. So as you may remember, we have recognized this as a second degree polynomial, p lambda. Second degree polynomial in lambda. Okay. So what do I mean by this? So let's say that this is a lambda square then this part is and I have C. So this is A lambda square plus lambda B plus C. Okay? A polynomial in lambda. Now as we have done before, let's calculate the discriminant. But we know that since this is always positive, then this polynomial has no real roots. That means that discriminant is, or let's say that um, lambda discriminant is less than or equal to zero. Okay. Otherwise, it would be having two roots, and it, in between those two roots, this polynomial will be taking negative values. Okay. Well, note that a is positive, and so on. So if I calculate b square, so I get four square of this. parentheses square, there is a 4 over here, less than or equal to 4ac, a times c, the 4s cancel, then I have, I have this, so we are almost there. Now, if I divide by this, this is a positive quantity, and take the square root, So I see that this is less than or equal to 1. So first I take the square root. These are positive. So I take the square roots. This can be positive or negative, so I take the magnitude of this. Okay. Then divide by that number, positive number, so this is this. So you can right now recognize that this is indeed our Rxy definition. Okay. So this is Rxy, meaning that autocorrelation. So this shows that autocorrelation, sorry, correlation coefficient, sorry, correlation coefficient between x and y is in magnitude less than 1. Okay? Okay. Now let me again discuss this equality case. Let me see. So what happens at the equality to equality case? In the equality case, so I have equality over here. Equality means that, now I have equality over here, means that b squared is equal to 4ac. Well, in the equality case, discriminant is equal to 0. Okay. Okay. Then, this polynomial is something like this, lambda minus lambda x parentheses square, okay? Meaning that it has double roots, double roots that, let me make this, not x, but some special value, lambda star. Previously, I have used plus over here, right now I'm using minus. So that means, now, Discriminant is equal to zero. There exists a root, which is a double root of this polynomial. But what was this polynomial? So this was like x plus lambda y. Okay, square. This is this polynomial. Then, so I see the following. Expected value of x, um, 
for this lambda star y parentheses square I have something like that okay when lambda is equal to lambda star this is a zero then this has to be equal to zero because this is p lambda star okay that is it now if this is equal to zero expectation result is equal to zero so how can this be equal to zero integrant is always non-negative the only cases you may say there can be some difficulties technical difficulties but let's think about the simplest cases so this shows that random variable x plus there is a special lambda star is equal to zero okay otherwise this integrand will be positive if it is positive then the expectation will be positive okay so we are getting this so x is equal to minus lambda star y and this is just a scalar as you see over here I have called this you know let me call this 1 over a if you wish then y is equal to a times x any number actually okay so we, we see that if so if r x y is equal to plus minus 1 this implies that y is equal to random variable y is or x a times x they are related in this fashion so how can I show the other way so this is double sided as you see well that's even easier just insert this over here and you get you know one okay so we can show this now you are assuming that y is equal to ax then you calculate rxy and you are getting rxy magnitude is equal to 1 okay let me do this in a very fast way so if I have this then rxy is from here x times y expected value of xy numerator is this now this is equal to expected value of a square x times this y square is sorry this is expected value of x square I have a square over here this is x square I have square root so instead of y I'm writing a times x mu a r a times x that is it so as you see if I do this because these are positive and there's a square root over here this is absolute x a divided by absolute x is so we are getting you know sine of a essentially okay because I think it's clear a divided by absolute a this is sine of a and it is plus minus one okay so this shows that this is double side it's very easy to see okay now this is the case for let me keep this let me keep this for a while for zero mean random variables so let me erase this part and give the general definition but before the general definition so let's think about what that this what this means okay let me also erase this part so this means the following now x and y are two random variables so rxy corresponds to
in a way, let's say, in a loose way, the angle in quotation between x and y. So these are random variables. So if you say the angle between x and y, of course, you know, you're in a strange position. But what is maybe calming is the following. If IE, if RXY is equal to 0, and if RXY is equal to 1 at these extreme cases, what's the meaning of this? If RXY is equal to 0, then in this case, so over here I'm assuming x and y are uh, 0 mean. If this is equal to 0, then this product expectation of the product should be, numerator should be equal to 0. Okay. And similarly, this is as we have said, y is equal to ax. Let's say plus minus 1. Okay. Plus minus 1. This is ax. So this makes a lot of sense because we are thinking that this corresponds to the case of theta, angle between them is equal to zero. Okay? So theta is the angle in quotations. How about this? Well, this should correspond to the angle, or let me write theta. Theta is equal to 90 degrees. Okay? Well, this is nice because it shows that these two random variables are nothing but the scaled versions of each other. Like as if they are vectors. This makes a lot of sense. How about this one? This one, well, there is a name for this. Guess what is it called? If two random variables satisfy this, let's remember property, let's say this is a reminder. If expected value of x and y is equal to zero, then x and y are said to be orthogonal. Very surprising, isn't it? Random variables. So maybe you have seen this definition in earlier probability courses. So these definitions, actually this verbal attachment to the definitions are given very carefully. So as you see this orthogonality concept, maybe introduced in earlier probability courses, it's not properly explained, but because you don't have enough time at those early courses. But what, what we right now see is the following. If the correlation coefficient is equal to zero, then I have such an equality. And this corresponds to, as you can imagine, this name is given orthogonality of these two random variables. OK. So let me have some you know, simple example. A simple example so that we can see more like vector-like behavior for these two random variables. Now, I have a random variable y. This is ax plus n. Okay? So I'm assuming that x and n are zero mean random variables. Random variables. Okay. Then, what's the question? Let's calculate, find rxy. Okay. So that's the correlation coefficient. So the solution. So first of all, expected value of y is what? So this is expected value of definition of y. Ax, let me make this, plus n. Now a moves out. Now by linearity, this separates into two expectations. And this is zero mean. This is also zero mean. So you get zero. Okay. So this shows that you know x is zero mean, y is zero mean, meaning that I can apply this definition for correlation coefficient that we have seen for zero mean random variables. Okay. So let me try to apply that. Okay, so how can I apply this? Now, Rxy 
is expected value of, let me write this one more time, xy divided by this is this. Now, how can I calculate this? Now, I'll be inserting the definition for y. x, this is ax plus n, and this part is the same, let's say. I'm not writing it again. So this is a x squared plus expected value of x times n. But this is equal to zero. Why it's equal to zero? Well, x and n are zero mean, let me also write this, independent random variables. Okay, independent random variables. Now, why do I need that? Because this is also the same as this. Let me calculate over here, expected value of x and if they are independent, x and n are independent, so this is an expectation over joint density. Then this is expected value of x times expected value of n. Okay. Then both of them are zero mean, so this is zero. This is also zero, so their product is equal to zero. But in order to separate this into two products, product of you know, expected x times expected n, so I need this independence over here. Okay. So numerator is essentially a times expected x square. So let me write the denominator then more clearly. So this is, well, let me write it over here because I need some space as you can imagine. So expected value of x squared is, let me put this, since x is zero mean, this is the second central moment or the variance, okay? So second moment and second central moment coincides because x is zero mean, so this is the variance. How about y? This expected value of ax plus n parentheses square, okay? Now, this is sigma x square. Let me expand this. A, expected value of x square plus 2A, expected value of xn plus expected value of n square. But I think we are clear with this. This is also sigma x square. This is, as we have said, zero. And this is sigma n square. And let me close this bracket also, okay? So at the end, what do I get? Let me write it over here. A, this is sigma x squared also, sigma x squared. Then I have a square root over here. This is sigma x squared. There is a square also over here. If you take the square of this, I have a square x squared. Now, let me um, do the following. a square, sigma x square, 1 plus sigma n square, a square, sigma x square. Okay. So I'm at this, well, what did I do? This part is this part, and this is these two terms. So I have pulled these two terms out of this bracket and multiplied by 1 and this is sigma n squared divided by this, so I get that. Now you can see that I have the cancellation of this with this. Okay. So the final result is 1 over square root of 1 plus sigma n square over a square sigma x square. So I get something like this. Okay. So this is my Rxy, but let me also give an SNR definition. SNR definition. So what is SNR? Signal to noise ratio.
Okay. The center is called the signal to noise ratio. So this is my observation model. This is my signal term, let's say. And this is my noise term. So SNR, this is just the definition. It is defined as, you can define so many things, but SNR turns out to be a useful definition. So this is the ratio of signal power, the term that you are interested in, divided by noise power. So in electrical engineering, power means, well, you are always thinking uh, there is a resistor, for example. Over that resistor, maybe you are doing some AC analysis, AC circuits, you are calculating the average power. Okay? So power is related with the square of this quantity of interest. Maybe you consider it like a voltage. It's a voltage of a, you know, a voltage output of a, you know, receiver. Then you are dissipating this voltage over a resistor. So how do you calculate? There is always a squaring involved. Okay? So signal power means second power actually, and this corresponds to electrical power, you know, energy, electrical energy and power. So this is the quantity signal, it's second power, divided by, this is N. So since over here we have, you know, um, random quantities, I'm talking about average in the sense of expectation. So let me say over here average signal power, average noise power. Of course this averaging makes sense if we think about the empirical interpretation of expectation. Okay? Average signal power, average noise power. So what do I get? You get a square, sigma x square divided by sigma n square. So this becomes our SNR for this problem signal-to-noise ratio. We will come back to SNR in some other problems also. This turns out to be, this ratio turns out to be very useful. So if you check this, then this is equal to 1 over 1 over 1 plus 1 over SNR. If you check this, this is 1 over SNR is over here. Okay. So what does that mean? Well, Let's say first of all, do we see that this number is less than or equal to one in magnitude all the time for all SNR? Well, obviously we see that because SNR is a positive quantity, and then the denominator is larger than one. This is just one. Okay, numerator is one. So this quantity is less than 1. What else can we say? As, oh, let me write this as a note. Rxy in this example is clearly less than 1, less than or equal to, because, or equal to 1, for all SNR values. Okay. Let me see. Also, as SNR goes to infinity, then Rxy approaches 1. Okay? If SNR goes to infinity, this becomes 0, I have 1. So in that case, so what was the meaning of that? That is SNR approaching infinity. So how can this SNR go to infinity? There are two cases. Numerator can be infinite or denominator can be zero or there can be a limiting situation uh, between these two. But that as SNR goes to infinity, we may or let me write it differently. That is for a fixed sigma x square as sigma n square goes to zero, meaning that noise power is going to zero, we have 
r x y is equal to approaching to 1. Well, as you can imagine, if this noise power sigma square variance of this, this is 0 mean, and if its variance is also equal to 0, then you have this case, y is equal to a times x, no surprises. That is the case when observation y is aligned with observation x, or sorry, input x, you may say. Okay? But please remember, these are random variables. Now I'm trying interpreting those random variables as if they are like vector-like quantities because of our correlation coefficient definition. Okay? Now, what happens for the in general? Now, in general, we have a situation like this. Assume that this is my signal, Ax. Let me show it like a vector, Ax. Now, if this signal power is much larger than noise power, meaning that the norm of this vector is much bigger than norm of this noise vector, this noise vector, then this is observation vector, y. Now we can see the following. The angle between them, this is theta in terms of vectors. Or this is the correlation coefficient for our purposes. So you see that if this n is getting smaller and smaller, of course y is more and more aligned with ax. At the end, they are like you know, in the same direction. Okay. So we have such a case. So we see that if this x is very large signal of interest, ax, and noise is you know, a vector, but something like that. It's very small. In com its norm is very small in comparison to the signal. Then clearly we see that observations are in high correlation, what we say, with the signal. Let me have something like this. In other words, this correlation coefficient or the angle between those two things, is angle is small or correlation coefficient is high, cosine of the angle is large. Okay. So this is the way, as you see, even though I have a random variable, two random variables, I am trying to understand how they are similar. Okay. That is the way. We are trying to give a geometric description um, for these interpretations, as you see. Okay, now, next, please remember this. Next, we will give the general definition for, again, correlation coefficient. But before that, maybe I should define correlation. Correlation is defined as expected value of two random variables are multiplied, x and y, is the correlation. Correlation of x and y. Okay? This is our correlation. And if you calculate this, you know, correlation coefficient for zero mean case, you have that. Now, let me do the general definition. Correlation coefficient for non-zero mean general case. Let's do not give any details. Okay, correlation coefficient. This is the actual definition. So R X Y again expected value of X minus this Y minus this then I have again square root X minus X bar y minus y bar parenthesis square. So what is the difference? So this is our definition. So this is general definition for non-zero mean x and y. First of all, if x mean y mean is equal to zero, obviously we get this. Okay? we get the earlier zero mean case. But what is interesting is, maybe if you see this 
If the random variable x has the mean of, let's say, 5, this bracket, if you check this bracket, x random variable minus 5 then has 0 mean. So this bracket is 0 mean. Similarly, this bracket is 0 mean. So this bracket is 0 mean. This bracket is 0 mean. So random variable x and y, they are not 0 mean, maybe. But if you take into account these individual brackets, they are 0 mean quantities. So I can say the following. So let me see. The value of Rxy is independent of mean values of x and mean values of y. Mean value of x and mean value of y. Why? Well, since Rxy is a function of x minus x bar random variable and y minus y bar random variable. So if you, for example, change the mean of the x to from 5 to 6, it doesn't matter because this bracket is always zero mean. So you define a new random variable. So this always a zero mean random variable. So in signal processing, well, in general, the mean will be the signal itself. Okay. So we are writing the mean explicitly. And all of those random quantities that are affecting this mean called mean will be they, they will be zero mean quantities because they are like noise. They will be like um, some other terms affecting our observations and so on. So in general, we will be defining random variables with zero mean. Okay. So this is the reason that sometimes, you know, uh, I use this zero mean definition, but this is a true definition. In the true definition, you subtract out the means. Okay. Before the, any operation. But let me write the following. Now we have our xy as defined. This is also written as covariance of xy. So what, what do I mean by this? So this part is, this is indeed this is called covariance of x and y. So this is correlation. Now this is covariance. This is this. Co co covariance is this. So clearly this is variance. This is the variance of x. This is the variance of y. So V A var over here. Let me write it again. This is variance. Variance this. So now, what we see is the following. So let me write this. Call xy, which is equal to expected value of x minus x bar, y minus y bar, is equal to, let me expand this. Well, OK. So I have, again, four terms. These terms are over here. So how do I calculate this? x times y expected value. x times y bar. Or let me do this. x bar times y. But x bar is a constant value. This is the mean value. It's a scalar. You can take this out of this expectation. So I get this. Okay. Similarly for this one. But clearly, this is equal to this one y bar, then one of these terms cancel. So you see that this is equal to expected value of xy minus xy. Okay. So this is called the covariance. Covariance of random variables 
x and y. Okay. So how do I associate the meaning this covariance? Well, again think about this. This is again acting like an angle. Okay. As we have said, this is independent from the mean value. So all of our discussions over here, they are also valid for this one. But we should be a little bit careful. So because there is some terminology also over here. So let me define this. So if co x y is equal to zero, covariance of x y is equal to zero. So what's the meaning of this? So this is equal to expected value of x y is equal to expected value of x times expected value of y. If this is the case, okay. Well, if this is equal to zero, then this is covariance. It is equal to this. Okay, this one. So this is equal to zero. Then I have this. So this is called then x and y are called uncorrelated random variables. Okay. If x and y, if they are also zero mean, then expected value of x, y is equal to zero. These two random variables are called orthogonal this time. There's a definition like that, but in general, uncorrelated random variables is a more, much more important definition. Uncorrelated random variable means covariance is equal to zero. If the mean is also equal to zero, then uncorrelated is equivalent to being orthogonal. Okay. In signal processing, as I have said, the mean will be, in most of these cases, will be equal to zero. So uncorrelatedness is an important property. Okay. Let's see what else do I have. I have an example. Okay. So let me erase this correlation definition. Should I keep this? Um, I think I can erase this one also. So what is this example? Now this example is again about the meaning of correlation coefficient, covariance, etc. So x is a random variable taking only two values, binary value to random variable. So A happens. What is A? It's an event A. This is other. So this is Y. 1, 0. B happens. Maybe B is a Bullcaser score, meaning a match. Okay? Then you get 1. So what's going on? X and Y are binary valued, as you see, random variables. Okay. Question is, find covariance of X and Y. Okay. So I need to find the covariance of X and Y. So how can I do this? Well, let me write the definition. Covariance of x and y. This one. Expected value of x times y minus expected value of x times expected value of y. So I need to you know, evaluate these expectations. So this is a joint expectation. It's only expectation over a single variable, marginal of x and marginal y. So how can I do this? Well, it's actually quite simple. The reason is this product is equal to 1 or 0, because this is as you see. Well, actually, this is called an indicator function. If this event happens, this is an indicator function of this event. It takes the value 1. This other event happens the indicator function takes the value 1 and it's equal to 0. Okay? So in this expectation, I get a non-zero value only when this is equal to 1 and this is equal to 1. So I have 
Well, binary valued case, I have, you know, if I multiply x with y, I have 1 times 1, 0 times 1, 1 times 0, 0 times 0, 4 possible cases. Among them, only non-zero cases, this and this. So this is 1, x is equal to 1, y is equal to 1, times probability of x is equal to 1, y is equal to 1. Okay? But x is equal to 1 is probability of a happening, y is equal to 1 is probability of b happening, but I don't know whether they will happen jointly or not, but this is the probability. Okay? Or I cannot say anything about their probabilities. Minus, now let me do this. So this is, I think we got the idea, 1 times probability of x is equal to 1. Whatever this probability. The other cases, x is equal to 0 times probability x is equal to 0. Okay, this is this. Now I'm not writing 1 anymore. This is y is equal to 1. Okay. Very good. That is it. That is the end of the problem. But let's think about some cases. Cases. Number one. So in this problem, let's assume that covariance of x, y is equal to zero. So indicator functions, their covariance, this somebody is telling us that it's equal to zero. What's the meaning of this? So the meaning is this number is equal to zero. So probability of x is equal to one, y is equal to one at the same time is equal to probability of x is equal to 1, y is equal to 1. Okay? But please remember, this is nothing but event A happening. This is nothing but event B happening. And this comma is A intersection B. Okay? They are happening at the same time. So this is A, this is B. So what we see, if their covariance is equal to zero, if somebody is telling us that if their covariance is equal to zero, from this result, we see that A and B are independent. Okay? So, interesting result. From this covariance information, for this case, for this example, if it is equal to zero, I get this. Now, the second case, so I get the independence of two events, A and B. So covariance being small means maybe they are not zero but small. Maybe they are closer to the independent. Okay? Something like that. So this covariance calculation. So again, covariance is equal to zero corresponds to vectors are at 90 degrees. So that's our interpretation. Now if covariances x, y is positive, what will be the change? So instead of this inequality, I have this, isn't it? So can I write this? So I have this over here. But let me write it. Let me divide by probability y is equal to 1. Then I have this. But what is interesting is, now this is equal to maybe you have recognized it immediately, x is equal to 1 given y is equal to 1. Conditional probability definition. So this says the following then. Probability of x is equal to 1 given y is equal to 1 is greater than equal to probability of x is equal to 1. Well, what's the meaning of this? Well, this is the probability of a, isn't it? This is a. A happening, given that B has happened, then this is the probability of A. So what we see is that if we know that B has happened, then the probability of A increases. So meaning that B, they are happening together maybe. So B event is affecting this A event. Okay? So these probabilities are being affected. But of course, well, this is interesting. If the covariance is positive, I have such a result. Now you can also write, if you interchange these two, put x is equal to 1 over here, y over there, then you have this result. y is equal to 1, given x is equal to 1, greater than. So you move this y to this side, x to the denominator. Okay? Now this time you see, this is b, a, 
B. Probability of B given A is larger than probability of B. Okay? So what is this conclusion? The conclusion is, so if the covariance is positive, if covariance XY in this example, of course, is positive, events A and B are, let's say, happening together. Meaning that if one of them happens, the other one is more likely to happen. Okay? So you can see, for example, in many uh, statistical or many discussions on uh, let's say economy and so on. For example, if the oil prices increases, then you are expecting that when the oil prices are increasing, you are expecting, for example, airline ticket prices to increase. Of course, it's not certain, but you are expecting that they will also increase. Okay, they are happening together. You don't expect a decrease in the airline prices. So these two events are happening together. Given that this has happened, the probability of that one happening in the next minute or so is increases. This is the way it is, especially in stock market and so on. Of course, if you reverse this inequality, then you have this negative. So they are not happening together. Okay? The probability of the other one will be decreasing. Now you see that this covariance information, well, it's not as strong as probability information, but it's telling us something. Okay? It's telling us something, at least in this case. So covariance being large means it's something good. If covariance is a very large quantity, this is much larger than this, okay? So covariance is equal to zero means in this case they are like acting independently. I don't have much information uh, between A and B because they are acting independently, okay? So this is the way it is. Of course, uh, now we have two ways of looking at this problem. The first way is in terms of vectors and angles and this one is also similar. The second one is, if they are orthogonal, this is equal to zero. Two vectors are orthogonal. If vectors are very much aligned, then they are acting together, as you see. They are also aligned in terms of probability. So this correlation coefficient, and as you can see, just because of that, covariance is an important quantity to study, as you see. Okay, what else do I have? Okay, now let me write, we're almost done, properties of covariance function. Maybe you will recognize these properties. Number one, Number two, number three, number four, these are very easy to prove because you just, you know, apply the definition, you get this, okay? So, do you recognize this? Well, these are, please compare them with axioms for inner product, okay? We have done something like that. So, for example, this is the symmetric condition. If I interchange their places, symmetric condition, nothing happens. So covariance and symmetric function. So how about this? This is the linearity in the first argument. If I multiply the first argument by A, then I can move that A out. Then A times X has the covariance with Y as co X Y times A. Okay, I can move this. So this is, again, linearity in the first argument you see, I have superposition of two random variables, x plus y, and their covariance with z is covariance xz 
plus covariance yz. So superposition in the first argument resulted, results in superposition of two covariances. Okay. So these are linearity, this is symmetry, and this is being positivity, or this is the definition of, you may say, the norm. Okay. Induced norm, you may say. Okay. We have such a case. Now, what else? One last example. So what is this? Let me see. Example. So how do we calculate the variance of I have n random variables, xi? How can I express this? Variance of summation of xi's are um, jointly defined random variables. Okay? How do I calculate the variance of a summation of random variables? Okay. So how do I do this? Well, so I will be using this part. So variance of this is equal to Covariance of one n. Let me use j. X j. I have used this variance of a random variable. This. Yes. Now what else? Now covariance function is linear in the first argument. I can pull this i summation out then. But it is symmetric. Then I can pull the other summation out also. Uh, okay, so what I see is xi, xj. So pairwise, as you see, pairwise covariances are needed. I know how to calculate pairwise covariances. So maybe this is a useful identity. This relation is useful for us. But let me also think about it like this. Let me process it a little bit further. i is equal to 1, i is equal to 2, i is equal to n j is equal to 1, j is equal to n. For example, let me write, this is a matrix, covariance of x11 at the 1, 1 entry of this matrix. So for example, this entry of the matrix, covariance of xi, xj. So this is the j entry, this is the i entry, and so on. So this last entry is, for example, covariance of xn, xn. Okay. So what do you see? Now if you see this, I am adding up all of the entries of this matrix, isn't it? Okay. I am adding up all of these entries. Now what I know is, these diagonal entries, they have a special meaning. It's called variance. So let me separate them. Or let me, before separating them, let me write for clarity. xi, xi. Then let me write all other entries also. 1, 1, n. But i is not equal to j. These are off-diagonal entries. Well, I know that this is the variance of xi by definition. So this is the covariance between two different random variables as you see. Okay? But what I know is that this is symmetric. So covariance 1, 2, x1, x2 is equal to x2, x1. So I can, using the symmetry property, let's a little bit simplify this. 2 times, I can maybe calculate only this upper diagonal part and multiply by 2. Okay, so 1 to n, so this is, then j, mm, covariance xi, xj. 
So this is from i plus 1 to n, I guess. So let's give it a try. So when i is equal to 1, this x1, j2, up to the last one. Very good. When i is equal to 2, j2, 3, 2, 3, and goes up to here. For the n, oh, for the n, this goes up to n minus 1, because this is not included. It goes up to here. When n is equal to n minus 1, I have this. Okay, that is it. That is as much as we can, as much as, uh, say, as much we, as much uh, as we can say. Now, um, if this is last thing, if you assume that, for example, these two random variables are uncorrelated, this is equal to zero then, then what we see is that variance of n random variables, which are uncorrelated, is nothing but summation of their variances. Okay? We have a result like that. This is a familiar result, and it's a general result covering this. Well, that's all I would like to say. But maybe before closing, um, let me also underline this fact. If two random variables x and y are independent, then this is an implication. So what do I have as an implication? x and y are uncorrelated. So unfortunately, we don't have that in general. If they are uncorrelated, then they are independent. The Reverse implication, we don't have that reverse implication in general, okay? X and Y are uncorrelated. So how can I show this? Well, let me write, please remember, uncorrelatedness condition, expected value of X, Y is equal to expected value of X, times expected value of y, isn't it? This is the uncorrelatedness condition. So let me calculate expected value of x, y for independent random variables. Okay, so how do I do this? So this is two integrals, x, y. Now I should write f, x, y, dx, dy, isn't it? But please be careful, since these are independent, this factorizes into a product, as you see. Okay. Now, as soon as you have that, this becomes and let me erase this part. An integral y dy. So why is the case? Because out of this, so this factorization, I can collect all the x terms together, all the y terms together. Then this is called a separable integrand. So x terms are integrated separately, y terms are integrated separately, and this is nothing but, it's called x bar, y bar, the mean values. So expected value of x, y is equal to the product of the means. And this is uncorrelatedness. So what we see is that, unfortunately, in many cases, we cannot say that two random variables are independent. We cannot say it. So reverse implication is difficult to say. But in many cases, we can say they are uncorrelated. In some special cases, uncorrelated, like in the example previously, uncorrelatedness may imply, in some special cases, independence. Okay? But uncorrelatedness is not equivalent to independence. But we are interpreting uncorrelatedness as some like lack of similarity or lack of dependency between two random variables. Okay. As we have discussed before, there is a geometric interpretation and so on between these two x and y vectors. If x and y vectors are not pointing towards the same direction, if they are orthogonal, we are interpreting them like uncorrelated random variables. 
Okay, thank you very much. That's all for today. Okay.